yourself as weary Come me and be undone When you see yourself as tired and unkind Come to me and I'll unwind your mind still mind today but I'm very very open to join with everyone in the depth of this uh, glorious stillness didn't really have a topic for this afternoon uh, at lunchtime and Akita was saying talk about humbleness talk about humbleness <laughs> and that's always yeah, a good topic because it's a word and um, I'd say it doesn't really come into awareness as an experience until you've really surrendered or until you've been receptive to hear the voice for God, the Holy Spirit, to hear the guidance and to follow the guidance. And then as you are willing to hear it and to follow it, then 
you begin to come into a, an experience of humbleness. And it's just another word for, for being totally filled up by the Spirit or totally emptied of the ego. Sometimes people ask me, how did it, how did it go in your parable or your experience? And I do remember back in the 1980s when I started to study the Course, it took me about two and a half or three years before I started to really receive guidance and instruction. And a lot of times it's thought, wow, it, that's really the goal of spirituality, the goal of the Course is to really start to be in touch with your inner teacher. And um, yeah, you could say that, you could make a case for that, and yet actually when you do come in touch with the internal teacher, that isn't the end of the journey, that's the beginning. And everything before that was kind of like treading water. <laughs> you were just like flailing away in the pool. You weren't really swimming, you weren't going anywhere, there was no movement, you were kind of pretending to be a human being and, and doing whatever you were doing, it doesn't really matter. But actually tuning in and hearing the Holy Spirit is just the beginning. And so that was very thrilling for me, because I thought, oh wow, this is the this is the beginning of simplicity, because the Holy Spirit is so simple that to just tune in and listen to that and follow that will surely lead me into a very simple, joyful experience. And so, it was amazing even in the day-to-day -day activities because it was like the internal teacher had lots to say, not just I love you or uh, the things that we think the teacher would say, but very specifics in terms of what to do, where to go, very practical, extremely practical. And um, it was quite interesting when I would go to retreats like this, or be guided to go on cross-country tours or whatever, it wasn't so much to speak. Uh, if I would even hint that I would like to start speaking uh, and teaching, the, the voice was, would like laugh, like, <laughs> like, well that's funny. Uh, because, because at the beginning when you start to listen and follow, you really aren't in a position, you don't really have a consistency yet that is like worthy of sharing. And um, even with Bill Thetford, the last ten years of his life, he really was tuning in, really was listening and practicing, but he didn't really have much to say even. It was more his presence was the teacher. And he would, people would feel it around him, but he didn't have a whole lot to say. I guess you could say he'd been speaking for many of the years of his life, and it was, he was just enjoying the basking and the, the stillness and the experience, I think. And also really tuning in to be shown what he needed to be shown, whatever his blocks were, whatever his sticking points, so that he could transfer the training and do his uh, Jim Carrey, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. And then he, he kind of laid his body aside on a sidewalk, not too far from Judy Scutch's house. And literally his heart burst. And so in the, initially when I would go to see some teachers, um, go to listen to Tara Singh or Ken Wapnick or different teachers, uh, I was quite still. I really didn't have a whole lot to say because there was so I was receiving so much instruction in my mind that it would have actually been a, a distraction to speak. And that was the beginning of like opening up to humbleness. When I would go to their teaching facilities and their workshops and everything, um, 
I would go there and I would enjoy meeting them and everything, but then when I would go to the teaching sessions, while they were teaching, there was a lot of internal instruction going on. A lot of pointers. So you can see it was a very still time of, of inner discernment, of watching the emotions very, very closely, noticing everything, and then receiving all this instruction while the speaker was speaking. And this would go on um, whenever I was in the kitchen or meeting people at a restaurant or wherever. And a lot of time just, I did a lot of driving. driving. I didn't really fly, so I would drive and I would just have music on, but I would have that instruction, keep being instructed, instructed, instructed. And I think that's, that's part of the humbleness. You really start to to see that in a very deep way, that that even things like speaking and words and the use of words needs to be in alignment to be truly helpful. You know, there's no need to use words as like filler space. You know, sometimes people talk about awkward silences and filling in when two friends have a moment or some minutes with a, a, an awkward silence, it's really, it's really, that will go away, but, but part of it is the Spirit's use of words. A specific example of that would be the scribe of A Course in Miracles, Helen Schuckman, who took down a very rapid interdictation course, what turned into be A Course in Miracles and the Song of Prayer and the Psychotherapy Pamphlet over a period of a little bit over seven years. And of course, hearing her story of how this went, working so closely with Jesus was quite helpful and instructive, because she didn't always feel like taking notes. Um, there were times when she would go for periods of time actually resisting taking notes even though the very first instruction that came from Jesus was, this is a course in miracles, please take notes. Uh, during those seven years, there was many times where it was like, I would rather not, and she would actually try to do anything but take notes, and then sometimes find herself waking up in the middle of the night, can't even sleep, and until she would follow the instructions and take notes, <laughs> come back to the project, so to speak. So, there was one point when she was pretty high in resistance, like a very strong resistance, and that's when Jesus told her, a good scribe must be under Christ's control. Interesting instruction. A good scribe must be under Christ's control. Interesting use of the word control. In that sense, it's, it's actually meaning alignment, like total receptivity, willingness. Very different from the way the word is usually used in this world. And so, I think that turns into your inner pathway to humbleness is you start to realize that, that as you seem to go through your day, you have this sense that you want to be used in, a, in the most positive, most helpful way, in one sense. It's very much a, uh, the St. Francis prayer, Lord, make me an instrument. It's really saying, let the vessel, let the body be used under Christ's control. In the early years, I, I used a lot of different metaphors from a lot of different movies, but some of you might remember Pinocchio, the story of Pinocchio. Pinocchio actually, you know, started off as a as a puppet. Geppetto, the puppet maker, and so Pinocchio was a puppet. And then his desire was to become a real boy. I did a talk the other day about autonomy, how valued autonomy is. And in the world's eyes, that's kind of an interesting story, because going from a puppet, an inanimate, just piece of wood, in going into a, a real boy, seems to be 
a marvelous transformation, except when we follow the parable of Pinocchio. He actually uh, goes through a lot of trials and tribulations um, when he doesn't listen to Jiminy Cricket. And he's trying to be his autonomous little boy and not listen to his little wisdom character that is in the movie. And that little wisdom character is very symbolic of the spirit, of the voice for God. He wants to be an autonomous little boy, and it doesn't go very well. He actually, um, he tried to just dismiss and, and get away from Jiminy Cricket, and then he's taken to Pleasure Island, which for little boys seems like a pretty good title. You know, what little boys are often attracted to, and it, it turns into a disaster. And that's very much what it is when we don't listen to our internal teacher. You know, we often find ourselves in an emotional predicament, wondering, where did I turn? What, what turn did I take to find myself in this emotional struggle or this particular predicament? So, my friend Resta um, channeled songs from the angels for a number of years with me early on, and and. Um, in one of her songs, you know, she she really was just saying, I want to be put back on the strings. Put back on the strings. I want to hand over my autonomy. Hand over my autonomy, the belief that I'm an autonomous person with a will of my own, and a mind of my own, and thoughts of my own, and decisions of my own preferences of my own and different individual loved ones and that seem to be part of a very subjective perception of the world, I want to get back on the strings. She would say that to me as we would be traveling around. I would love to be back on the strings. And uh, yeah, it was fun. I think Nikita had a talk with some people here prior to Strawberry where she was kind of using that, instead of on the strings, she was saying, how many people feel here that they're on a leash? <laughs> and some of the people who have been living and working with Nikita, they raise their hand, they're on the leash. She says, good. <laughs> I'm glad you feel that. <laughs> Interesting, it doesn't, that kind of a leash metaphor, when we talk about with a dog or an animal, that it seems like it's more free to be running wild than it is to be on a leash. So these metaphors are very interesting, especially in the context of humbleness. How would you even know what humbleness is if, if your entire mind was addicted and devoted pretty consistently to arrogance? It would be kind of difficult <laughs> to even have a clue what humbleness would be if everything about your life, your personality self and your personal history and, and even your ambitions for the future were all part of arrogance. All of it was arrogance. How would you know what was humble? It would be hard. Proud of your humility. Proud of your humility. Yeah, even proud of your humility. <laughs> you, could, you could say proud of being humble. Yeah. And those are the lessons those are the lessons that I know I went through where, yeah, I would get the witnesses, I would get the instruction, and it was all really coming down to, do you think you know something? You know, that's what it was. It was, <laughs> it was really all directed at one thing, do you think you know something? Really, do you think you know anything? That's, <laughs> that's how far it goes. And you, the further you go down the rabbit hole, the more that um, when you just when you think you've arrived and you finally landed on solid ground, and you're quite sure this time you're standing on solid ground, then the floor drops out. It's like a the door is open and and you're back in free fall. What's the the saying that we talk about here? Two feet firmly planted in midair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it.
And then, of course, there's songs, and I'm free, free falling. You know, it's, it's uh, actually starting to open up and starting to feel more and more comfortable with the free fall. Uh, that seems to be the most glorious thing when you when you actually have that free fall feeling and you start to go, hmm, I like this because yeah, it's like there's you're not you're not standing on anything as your basis. You're not thinking I have to have a foundation in the world because those foundations in the world they just fall away and they fall away and they keep falling away and. If you identify with the ego, it can be quite depressing. You know, like when when will these do trap doors <laughs> stop <laughs> opening? When will I land on solid ground? When will I have something to plant plant my feet on? And and it's not designed to take you there. I was talking with Sakita too at lunch today, and one day I came out and they were working, and I walked out here, and she was standing in the pond there and she had like a like a mop and uh, she had the funniest look on her face too because she was so willing I could just see she was just just radiating all this willingness and and I looked at her and I said uh, what are you doing and she said well I was told to clean the rocks and I said oh and we both just had a moment where we looked at each other like, how do you clean rocks, actually? <laughs> how do you know when they're clean? I mean, <laughs> she was given an impossible task, actually. And that was the glory of it. We both had to look on our face like it didn't matter who had told her to clean the rocks. And she certainly had the mop down there. She was moving the mop around down there, you know. And I, was like, I was kind of looking, and she was looking, and and then she shrugged her shoulders, and her hands went out, and I could we totally connected. I said, "This is it. This is this is the human condition. The human condition is that what Jesus calls this world, this linear world that seems to be so important, Jesus calls it an impossible situation." You find yourself in an impossible situation. It gives you a context in terms of when you think you have to try to improve the world, improve yourself, fix the world, change the world, make the world a better place. Once you start to get a clue of that, and I could tell we had, when Nikita and I looked at each other, it was like, yeah, this is an impossible <laughs> situation, cleaning rocks. And yet she was there. And yet she followed. And yet she, in her heart, she thought there must be a purpose for this, even so. So it wasn't really about cleaning the rocks. It was, it was the willingness to hang in there, even when you can't figure out, or you can't make any sense of what it is <laughs> that you're asked to do. And that happens a lot in this impossible situation. Many of us have worked at jobs where we actually go in and are employed to do meaningless things, and then we receive meaningless wages and go to stores and buy more meaningless things and go back to work to do more meaningless things. You know, it's a kind of an interesting thing that's going on, but that what would you expect in an impossible situation? If you feel bored, or if you feel unfulfilled, if you feel frustrated, what would you expect from an impossible situation? Those actually seem like pretty uh, reasonable emotions from trying to have an existence in impossibility from trying to make something from nothing. It was Billy Preston once saying, nothing from nothing leaves nothing. 
got to have something if you want to be with me. <laughs> something is spirit. Spirit is essence. Got to have something if you want to be with me. Imagine being sung to by your source. You are something with me. And you have no existence apart from me. I created you to be with me. It's a higher reinterpretation of that. I think it's Carly Simon's song, You Belong to Me. Yeah. It doesn't make much sense in the world. It sounds quite codependent, possessive on the horizontal plane, but just imagine the Spirit, God, you belong to me. You can only know yourself as you know me. You can only know anything as you know me. Nothing can be known apart from me. A lot of times I would listen to amazing Christian songs like um, Kim Car or Kim Walker we were just listening to before we started. And um, sometimes Christian singers will sing that God is a jealous God. <laughs> and well, Actually, in terms of jealous, you know, I think that was the time I think I heard Oprah Winfrey say that when she was at church listening to the minister, that was the line that she heard, our God is a jealous God, that she went, hmm, no, that doesn't seem right. <laughs> I don't think God's really jealous, and so she started her journey of, of awakening by that, maybe as a teenager, just saying, nah. God isn't jealous. But what Christian uh, singers like Kim Walker mean when they say our God is a jealous God, they say our God wants all of you, our God wants your attention, jealous for your love. That's the, the interpretation, very different <laughs> interpretation. In other words, I want your full attention because you are one with me, you reside in me, you live and have your being in me, and you need not put your attention on anything else, because that is where sleep comes in, that's where conflict arises, that's where struggle arises. Having your attention somewhere else under, other than spirit. So, it's really quite a journey, and just like Helen Schuckman heard about you need, a good scribe needs to be under Christ's control. You could fill that in with whatever you think your life is. Mother, father, sister, brother, or occupation, or citizenship, or your cultural background, or however you seem to identify yourself in this world, even as a human being. A good human being must be under Christ's control. That's your that's your lead-in to what I would say is pure goodness, not goodness of the personality self, but the goodness of the essence that you truly are. And so, there was a time in the scribing of A Course in Miracles over those seven years, where Jesus started out one day and he said to Helen, I love you. And Helen's like, okay. And Jesus said, so for just one day in your life, I'm going to point out all through the day where you could be more helpful. <laughs> it's like in one sense, you're under the microscope, but it starts off with, I love you. <laughs> now, and the whole day, Jesus pointed out every little missed opportunity for a miracle. An amazing thing. This was even beyond scribing. You know, a good scribe must be under Christ's control. Now he's looking at a day in the life. Imagine making a movie of that, <laughs> where you had like a little part of the screen which was the voice of Jesus. Right? Now, it was like things very simple, like she was coming down from Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, where, where she worked, and 
coming down to the lobby, I think, to go out. And she was just doing something so simple as catching a cab in New York City. It's a very common thing. It happens on a daily basis. Sometimes if you don't have a car and you've got to get around, it happens multiple times on a daily basis. And Jesus pointed out, uh, this, this man was right there uh, with you. Actually, I think it was somebody, I don't think she, she even knew him. He happened to be right there when she was hailing a cab. And he was going in the same direction as she was going. You could have offered him a ride, Jesus said. Just under the microscope. Imagine that when you think of your daily life and you think, oh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm doing pretty good and I try to be as friendly as I can and as helpful as I can and as courteous as I can. And I have my good moments and my bad moments, but imagine that for a moment, being under the microscope with Jesus Christ. How instructive that would be. Wow. Talk about getting into charity. <laughs> Talking about open your heart. Imagine how many minutes there are in a day. How many days in a year. How many years in a lifetime all those opportunities that are coming all the time. And what you really need is some instruction. And that's why we clear away the debris of false beliefs, of judgments, of grievances, so that we can tune in and hear our internal teacher leading us and guiding us on how to be truly helpful. Because it's all for us. It's like the voice that is speaking to us, the voice that's calling us home, inward, wants us to know ourselves as happy. We were created happy, and, and having had amnesia, happiness amnesia, and found ourselves in an impossible situation, you need help, you need a guide, you need instruction. Right away, if you start to get the context of how impossible linear time is, and how how much you need help, then that puts your mind in a whole new frame of mind. You know. Bill Thetford was, was the one collaborating with Helen on calming her so she could take down this voice for God message and then and then he would like comfort her with one hand and type out the shorthand notes with the other hand. He was like, <laughs> he was called in to help out, do the best he could. Comfort, comfort, rub the back. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Seven years, okay, <laughs> keep going. There was a big collaboration going on. That's why they asked for a better way, and Bill was important in that. He was to comfort and to type it out. And so, with Bill, he was, he was a, head of the department and he, he never taught classes. He just fairly rarely ever taught a class even though he was in a, an institution of higher learning and Jesus would tell him through Helen, you're a professor afraid of professing. Right. You put yourself in an administrative position because you're afraid to teach. And not only that, Jesus would say, you're afraid to teach because you believe that teaching weakens you. When you teach, you are weakened. Isn't that great? Now that's construction. If you just find, well, maybe I'm kind of shy, or uh, I'd rather be not in the classroom. You know, that's, there's a, a mechanism going on there, but Jesus is saying, he identifies the mechanism. You're a professor, afraid of professing. But it doesn't stop there. He says, and here's what's going on underneath in your consciousness. You believe to teach weakens you. And, and that's why I think it takes a lot of internal instruction before you go out and think you have anything to teach anybody in terms of words. There's so much discernment. There's so much humbleness. There's so much opening to stillness. There's so much releasing resistance that's so important before you actually can, can teach what you would learn, before you actually can open up and and use the mechanism of speaking 
You know, there's, there's a purification that is going on that's very, very important, and it's all about humbleness. It's not about trying to go make a point. When people study teachers and teachings and, and they, they really haven't come to an actual experience where the presence is doing the teaching, not the personality self, but if you try to teach from the personality self, you will be an inconsistent teacher. Because the ego is not who you are. You can't teach consistently from a lie. You can't profess from a lie. Teaching is not just done through words. If, you're, if your attitude doesn't back up your words, if you don't have that consistent attitude behind you, then the words don't really convey anything of, of substance. And we know this as children, when parents, when our parents try to tell us, don't do this, and don't do that, and don't do this, and they still, their actions were still showing that they were still doing those things. That's when, as a little child, you, you kind of turn your mind off, and you go, no. You may not even know what the word is, but you know it's not right. You may not even be able to pronounce hypocrisy. <laughs> it's too big of a word for a little child, but, but there's something inside that goes, no, that's not right. Why would I listen to you when you're not demonstrating what you're speaking? And then when you look at spirituality, then it, it, you see all the more like, wow, Wow, it would have to be, peace of mind would be the demonstration, and then the words, if the words line up with the attitude, so be it, if there's a helpful value there. If they don't, it's better off not to attempt it. Because why? Because it's just arrogance, masquerading as teaching. And there's really no point in masquerading. It never serves us in relationships, in occupations, in anything in this world, there's really no point in masquerading. Even Halloween, you know, it's kind of interesting, some of these symbols of Halloween, with all of the symbols of blood and death and, and so on and so forth that go with it, but Halloween comes very close, food, candy, it comes very close to All Saints Day. It's interesting, now in America everyone knows Halloween, but <coughs> what? we forgot All Saints Day. You see how, how everything in this world is a reaction against holiness, a reaction against divine love. Even with Christmas, you know, kids grow up and more and more they, they, they lose any sense of the nativity scene, or any sense of the story of Jesus, and it becomes about presents. What am I going to get for Christmas? We even invent characters. Easter, Easter bunny, yep, John is bringing that up too. Resurrection, that's a little too frightening, let's bring in a bunny and lots of candy. Uh, Christmas, let's bring in a fat man with lots of materialism, <laughs> lots of a presence in his sack, and let's cover over the meaning. And you see how that's what this world is. It's just always an attempt to cover over holiness, to disguise holiness, to, to keep you further bound in the amnesia of forgetting your own divinity and your own holiness as a child of God, and get caught up into the symbols that were made in hate. <coughs> Sometimes people tell me, you know, of course I, I was in university for 10 years, so I, all, I learned about biology, and, and I remember, you know, watching in the Discovery Channel and everything about the wonders, the wonders, the wonders of the human body. And, you know, that's not an uncommon thing. And um, we've even had some great movies over the years about, you know, get going inside a body and, what was the one with? Inner space. Inner space. Oh my gosh. 
that was funny. Going, the whole adventure is pretty much inside a human body. Um, Fantastic Voyage. Those, those movies, you know, they would kind of take science and what we know about the human body and bring in imagination and mix them together, and some comedy. Interspace, you know, that, that had a lot of uh, very good comedians in it. And then we come into, I said, okay, after a while you start to realize this is feeling more like an impossible situation. This is feeling more impossible, like trying to maintain it with diseases and all the possible things that you're supposed to defend, to help this thing survive by defending against all these things, radiation and germs and diseases and genetic, you know, within the genetic disorders, it just goes on and on and on. A litany of, of fearful things. And it's so complicated that no one ever stops to go, where did this compl complexity start in the first place? Uh, it's, there's so much into the effects of complexity that there's no one who questions, is there even a cause for complexity? Or is this much to do about nothing, like Shakespeare talked about? Is this a whole big ruse? Is it a big distractive device? So that really helped me in hearing the Holy Spirit and reading the Course. Even Jesus saying, when we dress up the body, when you when you dress it up, when you hang ornaments on it, and when you, you know, put lipstick on and do whatever you do to it, he says, you try to make lovely what you hate. Those are strong words. The next time you think about dressing up or makeuping or doing anything for the betterment of the body, that's pretty strong words. That's to make lovely what you hate. What you hate? No, listen, I've been working for years to not hate my body, and I'm finally coming around and now you're telling me I still hate it? After all these years of acceptance? Of looking in the mirror and accepting, accept, I accept, I accept, I accept to make lovely what you hate, because the body was made in hate. The body is not a creation of love. The body was made in hate. Now we're going to go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> now I'm going to take you with me down, 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 down the rabbit hole. You've got all this so-called mysterious guilt that you can't seem to get rid of. Come on down. We'll go down. We're going to find out what this, what the mysteries are. What are these hidden secrets in the unconscious mind? Why is there such hatred of the body? Well, <laughs> in heaven, talked a bit about heaven and nirvana, where all is one. Uh, there, there could never be. An, an idea, there could never be a conception of such a thing as a body or a world, because all is perfect. As we were saying uh, on the stage there, there's no perfect people here. And that's the truth, there's no perfect people, there's no perfect bodies, and it's, it's, an, it's an impossible goal if you have the perfection of the body. There's even some spiritualities that actually teach the immortality of the body. You know, you've heard of those where some people say there'll be a hundred thousand saved, they'll live in paradise, or others say, you know, you reach a place of, of awakening where the, the body is maintained and they call it an immortal body. Oh, contradiction in terms again. Immortality belongs to spirit in eternity and never can apply to the body, which is temporary, which actually has no existence at all. At no single instant does the body exist at all. It is always remembered or anticipated. It's a product of time. It's a product of the ego. The ego, which is hate, the ego, with, which is self-deception, the ego made the body and the world and the cosmos, the linear cosmos. Now there are spiritualities again that teach, you know, God was bored, God was lonely, 
God was incomplete, <laughs> and I always laugh before I can even get to the second part of whatever the teaching is. But God created human beings so he wouldn't be lonely, so he could have some companionship, a family, a big family, seven billion, <laughs> still growing, <laughs> you know, something to complete. Needed something opposite to God to uh, create, to uh, fulfill. No, 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 no. In fact, Suzanne was uh, telling me one time, she said, can you, in very, very, very short words, give me what this whole awakening process is about? Can you give it to me really short and really succinct? And, and just in a way that I could understand. And I had forgotten all about it, because I, I said this so many years ago to her, and then it came out from her mouth again the other day. She looked at me and she went, Damn, 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 ah! <laughs> I forgot all about that one. <laughs> and what it is, is the body is part of a, of a projection of a substitute to make a substitute for love. <coughs> the body is a concretized form of sin. And sin is error. Sin is not a black mark on your soul. Some of us were raised with, you know, where you, you're going to burn in hell. <laughs> Because you're a miserable sinner and you got to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And then if you do, you know, you go to heaven and everybody else goes to hell. <laughs> you know, this is not, I was raised with that. But, but we'll say sin is an error to be corrected and the body is a concretized form of sin. So when people talk about the wonders of the body, I would say, let's use the word wonder in a miraculous way, the wonders of God, the wonders of spirit. But the body is not wondrous at all. It's simply, it was made in hate, okay, it was made in hate, but the Holy Spirit neutralized it, uh, brought it around to something useful. Something that was made in hate actually now is useful in waking up. That's pretty good. That's, talk about like neutralizing something like with acid or something in a science class. It's <laughs> this body and this world have been neutralized. And when they've been neutralized, they've been given over to the one, the comforter, the wise one, the one who has all the instructions for awakening. And therefore, again, this is good news. It's not bad news at all. This is really good news that the body is like the puppet under the control of the Holy Spirit. And when I say neutralized, I mean neutralized. I mean anything that you try to get out of the body, or make the body be, or make the body do, that is not in alignment with awakening, is going to be part of staying asleep. You're not going to wake up if you're using the body for the ego's purposes. Why? Because the ego made the body out of hatred, and it wants to use the body in tricky forms to maintain the hatred, to maintain the anger. It's a clever thing. It's ingenious. For a puff of nothingness, it's an ingenious puff of nothing. And really, I say puff of nothing, because when you pull your mind away from it, it's like the Wizard of Oz, the Wicked Witch of the West. It's like throwing water. There's nothing left but a hat and a cloak. Not a scary witch with a green pointy nose and this things. I told you about the making of the Wizard of Oz. I've been saying that that how many directors they had, how many different set changes and everything. When they did the original production of the Wizard of Oz, they did a, a like a sample, you know, where they show the movies to a sample audience. Even Hollywood did that back in those days. They did a sample showing of it, where they invited parents to come in. And they invited children to come in, and they showed the Wizard of Oz, and the children screamed and cried because they had so many scenes of the Wicked Witch of the West in the original movie that they had to go back and redo the movie and cut her parts down. 
Most of us saw that movie. I saw that movie when I was a kid. That was the scariest part. And imagine the, the majority of the movie was the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> so they did a test, test audience and they went, oh, revamp the whole movie. <laughs> Fire another director and let's get a new, new this, do new things. They had to redo the movie because it was too scary. It wouldn't go over. You couldn't put it, it wouldn't go, it wouldn't sell. So, uh, the world was made in hatred, the body was made in hatred, but it's now neutralized and anything you try to do for the purpose of the ego will simply reinforce the sleep and everything that you do, allowing the Holy Spirit to do it through you, you know, to, to be used as an instrument, like St. Francis said, make me an instrument, will be helpful in unwinding your mind from the guilt and the error and, and waking up from the impossible situation. So, it's good to know that what is that one thing <laughs> that the Holy Spirit is using this neutral, neutralized body for, and it's communication. It's communication. That's the one function of the body now, is communication. Let the Spirit play the piano through it, <coughs> sing through it, speak through it, caress through it, offer just this softness, this love, this laughter, this joy, it only has one purpose. And, and we know that. You can feel that. You know how good it feels when you're in that alignment, when you're being done through with that. Now not only was the, the body made in hatred, because it was made from hatred, but the world was too. So that's the whole cosmos. Hold no graven images before the Lord thy God. That's not talking about golden calves and totem poles and stuff like that. That's talking about everything in the perceptual linear world. The stars, the quasars, the black holes. Hold no graven images before the Lord thy God. And then we start to get away from a lot of non-dual teachings because some non-dual teachings will say it's not really so bad. And it's not that it, the world is bad at all because again it's been neutralized. It all comes down to the purpose. If you use it for the purpose of awakening, you will have glorious experiences, so glorious that in the end you'll forget the world and just return to glory. But there's a beautiful passage in the workbook where Jesus says, the world was made as an attack on God, a place where God can enter not. Give it to me straight, give it to me straight. Don't delude it to me. Don't dance around with me. I want to know the kingdom of heaven. I want to know the glory. Give it to me straight. Are, is that a popular teaching? No. <laughs> you may only have to come to me to hear it. Or read it in the book from Jesus directly. But, that's not the emphasis. The emphasis is on, okay, that's a good reason why the world I see holds nothing that I want. If you're going to know God and you're going to know oneness, then obviously you're going to let go of the valuing of the things of this world. There's a line in the, what is the real meaning of sacrifice in the back of the book, in the teacher's manual, where he said, God's teachers can have no regrets on giving up the pleasures of the world. That says a lot. No regrets. Does it mean you have to become a Buddhist nun or a monk or anything like that? It doesn't mean anything in terms of form. It's not like a formula where you have to now go out and try to conform and find the right form. But it does mean to just open your heart up and say, Okay, I want to be guided. I want to awaken. I want to know the truth. I want to know myself. I want to be in alignment. I want to be in flow. And, and I would say it's so joyful that that's been, the whole seeming journey has not been sacrificial at all. You know, I don't, I don't have a day that goes by or a thought that goes through my mind of regret. I don't regret anything. Of course you can see by following this book and these teachings how that would rinse the regret away. You know, when the underpinnings are so clear, you know, it's so clear. It's like saying, 
Hey, I'll teach you what's valuable and what's valueless. And you don't know the meaning yet, but I'll, I'll do that. So that's the journey. It's really a journey without distance, but it really is starting to, to take it in. And then you start to really discover what this is all really about. Where you anticipated a loss, you find a happy lightheartedness instead. It's that Carly Simon song, Anticipation, remember that one? It's keeping me waking. Yeah. yeah. Anticipation, what you find is everything that you anticipate God is going to take from you, or every anticipation of loss, like, okay, I'm, I'm praying to God, now what's, gonna, now what's next? What are you going to take from me now? Um, anytime you're in that perspective of feeling like taken away from, like you're losing something, you know, that's just a, a misperception, that's just an ego perception. And when you flip through into the miracle, you find a happy lightheartedness instead. Where you anticipated grief, you find a happy lightheartedness. Isn't that wonderful? That on the, ev on the opposite side of a grievance is a miracle, is the ah, damn, damn, <laughs> damn, damn, ah. And actually you can live in the ah. You can live in the ah. You can live day to day, moment by moment, ah, 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 ah. You know, you can, you can actually live in there. There's no need. You don't really live in the damn, damn, damn anyway. You know, it's, that's, that's just confusion. That's just doubt. That's just hesitation. You know, and when you really give it over, you know, give it over, give it up, as they say in the churches, give it up, give it up for the Lord. Yeah, that's, that's right. Start to sound a little like Donna. <laughs> I really like that. You, uh, that gospel, that go gospel music, and Donna. I, just, I had to try to explain that when I came down from there, and they're like, "What happened in there?" That was like an explosion. They heard that all the way up and down the canyon. It was louder than the music, and, and we were inside <laughs> in the <a> chapel. <laughs> I, I got a home and got back over here to the monastery, and they were so curious, what was going on? <laughs> <laughs> My God, that's right. It started off with a good old gospel <laughs> piano rendition, and then it took off from there. None of us know what happened, but but it was beautiful. We all felt the joy. I'm glad they recorded that too. I've never seen so many crying faces. Not that they were crying out of sadness, but they were laughing so hard <laughs> that they they couldn't stop crying. It was that explosive. But that's living in the awe, you know, that's, that's really what this is about. And all this other stuff, you know, this metaphysical stuff is just preliminaries, preliminaries. You know, it just, it just sends you off, it sends you in the right direction. And there's so much more to it. The, the metaphysics just are like a launching pad. Eventually, you just actually forget it. You, you just lose track of it all. You don't think of it. It doesn't come into your awareness. That's like a little trampoline. You're supposed to be like a kid. Get on the trampoline and just keep bouncing higher and higher until you just launch out of there. You just launch and you fly. You don't ever come back to the trampoline. You don't ever have to come back to the trampoline. So it, it has helped me whenever I thought something was going wrong, something was being taken from me, whatever. It's, it's just been this assurance like, no, you don't know your own best interest. This is in your best interest. Whatever seems to be happening is always in our own best interest. Now, there is nothing apart from our own best interest. It's just a distorted perspective that tells us that we're lacking something, missing something, missing out on something. Yeah, and that perspective is just not real. It just doesn't have any value or any validity whatsoever. So that's my spiel for today. <laughs> that's our sermon here today. <laughs> and now I just want to open it up, because then we come into yeah, practical application.
really, that's, that's really what we're about. Transfer of training, pra practical application. <laughs> I hear a sigh over there. <laughs> Thanks again for the invitation down the rabbit hole. Uh, one of my favorite parts of The Course in Miracles actually is the song of prayer. It's so beautiful, and I'm feeling it would be lovely to hear you speak of that, about it, and some of your thoughts on the song of prayer. Yeah, it, it to me is, uh, is giving some words and metaphors to the seeming journey of a rising up um, back in the 60s we called it Raising Consciousness, and I think that's really what the Song of Prayer is about. It's, it's, it's about purification, and it's about opening up to a clearer understanding of prayer, about a clearer beholding of the power of prayer and the power of the mind. I'd say out of the, all of the Song of Prayer, I mean, it's just an amazing teaching, but um, there's always something that stands out. And the one that I like the most, this one launched me into mysticism. The one sentence, you know, sometimes out of something great, you eat, a certain sentence just leaps at you and you just are taken by it, like lifted up. And the one sentence that really helped me in my journey into mysticism was, the secret of true prayer is to forget the things you think you need. The secret of true prayer is to forget the things you think you need. Because the things you think you need, the best way to see them is, is you're going to offer them up to the Spirit, to the Holy Spirit, as a present. I was using that example the other night, it was like a little child who comes with the poop to mom, <laughs> mom and dad, but I got a present with such glee. What's that dripping on the carpet? Uh, it's when you offer the things that you think you need up to God, then that is the secret of true prayer. So that unleashes prayer, that releases prayer. Prayer is your desire, prayer is the desire of your heart, and prayer in the sleep, to the sleeping mind is, is fragmented. It's, there seem to be many desires, many preferences that are part of the human condition, part of everyday life. And these seem to be natural in this realm, but they're very unnatural. There's, in heaven there, there is no sense of these things. For years I've said, once you start to understand in the quantum sense that everything that you experience in your, in your mind or your consciousness is really the experience of the whole universe. So I've used that saying sometimes, when you want a Snickers bar, the whole universe wants a Snickers bar. Because your mind is the whole universe. And the secret of true prayer is to forget the things you think you need. When you go to that place of complete acceptance, when you go back inward to that place of God, spirit, call it whatever you want, no thingness, whatever you want. When you go into that, you release the power of prayer to take you home. And so in the Song of Prayer, prayer is described as a ladder. And then the top of the ladder is given some words, and I, I love those words that the top of the ladder is given, because the top of the ladder is when the ladder disappears. You don't get to the top of the ladder and and go tell your war stories, or, you know what I went through to get here? <laughs> damn, 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 damn. <laughs> you know, you, you, don't, you don't recite the steps once you get there. Actually, when you get to the top, the ladder disappears, and never was. It's like, remember, this is an impossible situation, so you're in a hallucination of rising up. You're already there. You already are who you are, and always have been. But it's just a hallucination of a ladder that disappears when you reach the top. And the way Jesus, he actually uses some Christian 
almost Bible sounding phrase at the very top. You know, what's the top of the ladder prayer? Father, what is your will for me? Wow. That's an open mind. You see, there's not asking for specifics. You're not saying, give me that Porsche. <laughs> you know, when you're at the top of the ladder, it's not there anymore. Father, in Christian terms, Father, what is your will for me? And then the ladder disappears. So, in, in what we would call this realm, the realm of perception, that's what we've been talking about all week. That's what I've been talking about. That's what Lisa's been talking about. Emptiness. I was in the hot tub this morning and talking to Lisa and she said someone had come up to her and said, uh, looked her right in the eye and said, are you fulfilled? <laughs> and she said, I am empty, was her answer. E emptiness. Some of you know about Buddhism, that's been Lisa's seeming route. Emptiness, emptiness, form is empty. Emptiness is form, no, you can, sutras and everything. What do you think all that's about? It's about empty your mind of everything you think you think, everything you think you know. Empty your mind of false desires. Let your desires be purified. Let your focus be on God. Let thine eye be single, is what Jesus said. Let thine eye be single. Let your perception be single. And when your perception is single, you're right on the verge of Christ vision, which is not perceptual at all. It's just pure light, just blazing light. But the entry point, you might say, into vision is unified perception. Let thine eye be single. Unified. Unified field, they call it in quantum physics. Unified. Wow. Quantum physics and Jesus come together, unified field, let thine eye be single. Wow, it's all the same. It's all coming there. So I also have tremendous gratitude. I just had tears of gratitude kind of coming through as I went through the Song of Prayer. And I've done workshops on it and all kinds of things over the years. But it's, yeah, it's a, I like that song, talking about a song of gratitude is really what it is between Creator and creation, which is all spirit. Just a, a spirit song of eternal gratitude. Just eternal gratitude. And I thank Jesus for the metaphor of song. I think that's a beautiful uh, metaphor to use for prayer. Here we are at a music festival, and, and you're bringing up the song of prayer. Yeah. So beautiful, thank you. Hi. I really feel to sort of um, ask about the seeming contraction that can happen as soon as we start really getting down this rabbit hole about that the body never was, you know, in the first place, and that it was made in hate. Especially, it's like, okay, say it never was if this doesn't exist, but then you throw in that, you know, we made it in hate, you know, or ego, ego. seeming, you know, seemingly. It was, this thing was made, <laughs> and it was made in hate, of hate. So it's like, to me, like, I laugh because that gets me excited because this is the uncompromising situation that I've been looking for for my mind to, you know, because I have faith in uh, what is offered from A Course in Miracles as, you know, for me to be, uh, to me to be back to that experience. So I get excited, like, yeah, let's, that full on, like, yes, this is it, let's go. I will go with you down the rabbit hole as, as best I can right now. But what comes up is, so as, as, we, as we may hear those things and contract a bit, because like, you know, when you go through these phases and you know you're, you're having these awakenings and some of us are having more mystical experiences, some of us are just having more just heart opening, kind of like feeling okay experiences. But then you hear something like that and it seems the mind can go, oh, how much more is there to go now? Wait, this is made in hate? And I sort of felt that, you know what I mean? I felt that maybe some of the group was, I don't know, I just felt that. I didn't necessarily feel that, although maybe I must have at some <laughs> some level. Um, 
So the fun, what I want to get to is this, I believe strongly also, it's true somehow, this can be totally joyous. This experience of some kind of thing that's leaving and we're on a way out of thinking that we are here. I totally believe that it can be lighthearted and, and fun. It must be, absolutely must be possible. So what maybe can we hear or think on with that little subtle trickery that as soon as we hear that, the ego just, oh, see, oh, we're st how much more now? It's made out of hate? Oh, what does that mean? How far now to go still? Yeah, it was so beautiful that that song came to you, Unwind Your Mind, because in that book that's just coming out, it, it's, it's almost like a how-to manual, you know, it's because it's got the students asking the questions and the spirit giving the answers and uh, I'm just getting already lots and lots of comments, lots of emails sent to me, lots of feedback like, oh my gosh, like these these students in the book are asking questions that I did I hadn't even asked. I didn't even know what the question was, uh, but but they're so sincere and they're so open and there are like the rabbit hole has many, many questions in it, but sometimes the feeling is, wow, you're asking my question. Wow, I didn't even know I had that question until you asked that question. Now I'm really ready to read the answer, whatever it is, because I'm, I identify with the question. So I would say, as we go down there, it, joy is, is always available, fear is optional, um, and that's good to, to keep in mind. Um, I know in this book probably, I, I'm pretty sure there's quite a bit about reversing cause and effect because what I've been talking about and what Lisa's been talking about is that, that there aren't any causes in the world. Uh, you are not at the mercy of the world, you were not caused by the world, and everything that has been part of the, the teaching of the world from through parents and teachers and scientists and everything that involves linear time, uh, even Newtonian physics and everything, it's all part of a lie. Like when you go to a party and, um, for example, somebody says, what sign are you? Is that a common thing? I don't know if they still ask that at parties. <laughs> uh, can I have your phone number? And they skip over all the... What, what, What's your sign? You know, they used to, maybe that was back in the '60s and '70s. I don't know what they talk about nowadays at the bars. But, um, but what sign are you? What's your astrological sign? You know, in the sense of, of astronomy and astrology and the stars and all the thing. You know, uh, or that now we have the Enneagram. I went down to Columbia one time and they heard me teaching at all these different Course in Miracles gatherings, and somebody said we have a big conference going on Enneagram. Uh, conference and we'd love to have you come and speak at our Enneagram conference and so I said okay so I didn't talk a lot about numbers and I did go to Sweden one time and the guy who picked me up at the airport he kept looking at me and he said mm, what number are you he was apparently into all that and I tried to make it easy on him I said uh, I'm all of them <laughs> and uh, he said ah, David like, David and then the same thing happens to me with astrology, or with somebody I meet, and they're like, what sign are you? And I said, I try to again make it very easy and be very accurate, and I say, I am all of them. And, oh, that's not an answer. But actually, what I'm trying to do with this is I'm starting to say that, that there's nothing of the world that causes who you are. You aren't a product of the world. You aren't a product of mom and dad. You aren't a product of genetics. Here we are in Mormon land, family trees, and you can trace it back generation, generation. No, no, no. You are not a product of genetics. You're not a product of the stars, of astrology. You're not a product of your environment. Some of you think that you were born at this particular time and space and you had to deal with the, whatever, the Vietnam War and all these different e world events that seem to be important to the world, you know, environmental events, but you're not a product of that. If someone asks you at a, at a party, where are you from, you know, you're from heaven. 
actually, you're from nirvana. Use any language that you want. That's, that's the actual truth of it. Really. That's the factual truth of it. And when you say, I'm from, and you fill in a, a city or a country or whatever, that's a lie. That's actually a lie. That's actually saying you're a product of something in the world. Do you think that I am-ness, I'm talking about before Abraham was, I am, I'm talking about the, the presence of love that is before the world was, that is before the Big Bang, before the cosmos. Some of you will get to see the movie Lucy. You'll get a taste of that at the very end of the movie. It's your pure light. You go back past the, the, the gases and the formation of the planets, and when you go through it all, you'll see that that I am-ness is actually true. That you aren't human and you've never been human, ever. And you actually have that experience, which is what Pete is bringing up, the, I call it the reversal of cause and effect. So this is basic cause and effect teaching, and basically God is the cause and, and we, as the Christ, are the effect. And we're together. It's not really in heaven, there's not a place where the Father begins and the Son begins, you know, it's all one spirit. So I'm just using it in terms of cause and effect teaching. That, that I and the Father are one, is what Jesus taught. He was just basically saying, cause and effect are one. That's what he was teaching when he was teaching, I and the Father are one. Cause and effect are one in reality, in, in heaven. And then in this world, cause and effect gets split off and turned around. That's where this whole idea of a split mind comes in. You can't have schizophrenia without a split mind. You can't have psychosis without a split mind. You can't have any kind of disease of mind without talking of a split mind. That's the original error. That's the fall from grace. The belief that the effect can leave the cause. The belief that Christ can leave heaven and take on a form. Take on a world. Take on something that's completely unlike heaven. Linear time is definitely unlike heaven. It is not even close. It has no resemblance whatsoever. To, to eternity. You know, we may see eternal as like a fragrance or something <laughs> here, but believe me, there's nothing eternal in time and space. Even the stars that burn out, their gases, you know, it's all temporary. It's all ephemeral. So, when you're talking about joy, it requires a clear alignment with true cause-effect relationships, and therefore Every time you think that something happened in the world that closed your heart, that you feel a contraction and you think it's because a word that was spoken. Let's use that example. David's happily talking in all of his joy and then he goes, the world was made as an attack upon God, a place where God could enter not. Bummer. Bummer. I was having a happy day. Having a good day. It's beautiful music, sun's shining, birds are tweeting. Having a great day. Great day. Until this guy arrogantly ruined my day with one sentence. Took my peace of God away in one sentence. Bummer. Shut me down. I contracted. I closed. You know, that's, that's as if words have causative abilities. And then we're you know, it's little kids, sticks and stones can hurt my bones, but words can never hurt me. Well, when we grow up as adults, we still have words <laughs> that seem to hurt, words that seem to sting. But it's only the interpretation, that's what I've been saying all along, it's only the interpretation in the mind is where the contraction comes. It's only in consciousness. It's only taking something seriously instead of laughing at it. Even that idea that I just shared, I think that's a laughable idea, only because the ego is not real. So, but it's just used as a way of kind of saying, there's an, is there an incentive to come to true cause and effect? That's, that's really what Unwind Your Mind is about. It's about bringing everything back to the true cause-effect relationships. I had a friend of mine, I, I did a cause and effect workshop with the students years ago, and a friend of mine, Jeffrey, he, he actually listened to the tape over and over and over, and then, then it was transcribed. He was, he was actually transcribing it for Teacher of Teachers, I think, and then eventually it probably made itself into this book. But he listened to that tape, he told me like 
He listened to the whole workshop like seven times before he started to get a sense of what it was talking about. The resistance in the mind to reversing cause and effect is so strong that the ego is putting on the brakes, saying, no, please, don't go down there. That's getting way, way too down low in the rabbit hole. That's getting, that's getting almost to the core if you reverse cause and effect. So God is the cause, Christ is the effect. In this world, cause and effect are split off and the world seems causative and your sleeping mind seems to be at the effect of the world. You hurt my feelings. You make me mad. Just think about when you were a kid. Did you ever say that with your siblings? You're grounding me. You bitch. No, we wouldn't say that to mom. Cause <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> if you did, you probably, Lisa, <laughs> you would not be here today. Some of us, the moms that we projected out there, if we said those words, that was death. <laughs> the ego would, would run away and hide. <laughs> but but the, the point is, <laughs> there's, there are, there's a belief system that, that the world makes us who we are. I mean, the belief that we're even born into this world, you know, through an egg and a sperm and, and, and the whole deal, this, this is all part of a lie. It's a very elaborate lie, you have to admit. It's very pervasive. Don't you notice? You know, I mean, I took biology and I was like trying to follow biology and I said, man, this is really complicated and you go through all this gestation and, you know, you go and you, and you make it through the teen years and then you finally get to adulthood, and it's just worse. It's worse <laughs> you think, it's going to get better when I'm an adult. But it's, it's actually worse, it feels worse. I was playing in the creek. I was just having fun playing in my summers, and, and then I got into all this learning, and learning, reinforcing all this false cause and effect. So Jesus calls these thoughts um, about that there's causes in the world, spurious cause-effect relationships spurious. You know, it's like, oh my, thank you. Thank you, Lord. My mind's infested. Oh God, thank you. I've got a major infestation uh, going here. Okay, better now to find out about this infestation than to just bewilderingly go along and be afraid of dying, afraid of growing old, afraid of getting ill and having pain and suffering. You know, that's how the mind goes, you know. Why do you think people invest so much in insurances and try to eat healthy, exercise, do all these things to fight off death, you know, to prolong life, you know, to fight it off because it's not painted in a very good picture. Growing old and getting sick and dying, you know. That's, is that the purpose of life? Get a gold watch and, you know, for so many years of loyalty to a company and then you, you know, you just go down and let the worms eat you? No, please. <laughs> So, you actually have to get to the point where you start to admit, okay, I've got an infested mind. It's infested. It's infested. And it's the, the pesticides and, and none of that works. That stuff just is... No, you need forgiveness. You need forgiveness. Without forgiveness, I will still be blind. You know, you have to come to see that that's, that's the answer. And hallelujah! If you're being told what the problem is, and that the answer is readily available, wouldn't you put all of your mind energy in going for the solution? Once you finally discovered what the problem was, it was an infestation of consciousness. You know, once you, I've never heard that word, the Holy Spirit's using new words, infestation. <laughs> Maybe it's because we're out in nature, I don't know. Bugs and all the mice that have been in mice, the Mice, mice in all the rooms and everything. Mice traps all over the place. It's an infestation. Uh, we were so funny, we were at the hot tub and we were laughing because there's a few of us out there and then yeah, Francis found a mouse up in her thing and, and it was just, it was the problem that it was in the room, in the room. And then uh, I think Suzanne said, oh, they get up on your bed. On, my, on your bed, it's just the imagination starts to go wild. <laughs> I mean, it was just a noise, an annoying noise, but now you're saying they climb, they actually can get up onto a bed and, oh yeah, onto, onto ah, ah, 
<laughs> just the thought of it. Ah, now you know why you're worried about infestation. Just so if one of them comes in the middle of the night, <laughs> you wake up, ah! You know, this is, and, and so this is in the mind. So, and the reason it's infested is because the cause and effect is split off and turned around. It's very scientific, really. It's cause and effect have been turned off, split around. If you leave all the religion out of it, all the, the different things, you go flip into a new vernacular of just cause and effect. That's the problem, is cause and effect, not in reality, because God and Christ are one, but in cause and effect they've been split off and turned around. So this is why you practice the mind training. This is why over the years we've lived in community, seemingly, because we're practicing together reversing cause and effect. You're practicing with everything. You can practice it with food. You can practice it with sun, sunshine. You know, I mean, I've had so many funny parables o over the years. One time I went to Argentina and after I was staying with a friend, I, I found one of these floaty kind of uh, rafts. I could go out in the pool and I could just, for the first time in my life, lay in the Argentina sun. And I was just laying in the pool, letting the breeze blow me along, laying in the Argentina sun, and then the daughter of my friend came out and started screaming, Get out of the pool! Get out of the pool! Get out of the pool! I was like, what, what? She goes, the sun! David, the sun! <laughs> like, this white boy from the United States just thinks he's coming down to Argentina and just laying out there in the sun, you know, just sun, the sun, get out! I just, Blowing, blowing kisses to the sun. That's why she's like, ah! You know, because it was a mindset. The sun, the sun, the radiation from the sun, it'll burn you to a crisp. You're going to be red. You're going to be sore. You're going to be painful. No, the sun doesn't, radiation doesn't cause pain. Separation from God. The belief in separation from God causes pain. The belief in separation is not a real cause. That's another <coughs> learning in forgiveness. It's not a real cause. And then when you see that, you're free of it. But, but that was that. Or around certain foods. Um, I went up to a hermitage one time in Michigan, Harrison, Michigan, and I would go there for weeks or months or whatever. And, and I had another hermitage down in Kentucky. So as a simple mystic, I just carried my food from Kentucky up to Michigan when I moved up to my Michigan Hermitage. And my friend Thomas came in one day and he started looking through my shelves and he was going, this, what, 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 this, what kind of food is this? And he'd say, the, he started reading the expiration dates. And years, not days, not months, years, it was expired for years, and he was like, what? He just started pulling stuff off the shelf. I'm going to have to go to the grocery store and buy you some fresh food and fresh fruit and fresh fresh to, to get you to have a fresh decent meal and so on and so forth. But it's cause and effect. You see, that's just another basic thing of time. It's a mesmerism around the age of food and what happens to food and what what old food can do to you, and on and on and on and on. Or organic, you know. It's like when I was traveling around the country and just going around and around, I was told, eat what's served. But I was never told by Jesus, ask whether it's organic or not. <laughs> eat whatever is served, as long as it's organic. No, he didn't, he didn't put that caveat with it. There was no disclaimer, there was no additional thing, but da-da-da. Eat whatever you have served. It's kind of like he said, you know, abide where you are taken in, and where you are not taken in, dust off your sandals and go on. You know, and he said those things. It, you know, it's not what you put in your mouth that defiles. Boy, wouldn't that be great with all the healthcare education we got going on now? All this education about be careful what you put in your mouth. And, and he already said 2,000 years ago, it's not what you put in your mouth that defiles. It's what's in your heart that defiles. What is in your heart that defiles? Reverse cause and effect. <laughs> Reverse cause and effect. So we were talking about that today, follow your heart. Isn't that a lovely phase, follow your heart? 
wouldn't you really like to know what that means? <laughs> wouldn't you want to go down the rabbit hole on that one? And really get to the bottom of follow your heart. Really, from Jesus Christ, one who actually followed his heart, who actually transcended the world, and who is, uh, I would say, appropriately called way shower. The way shower is one who, who's gone through the darkness and come pierced through into the light. If I was going to have a teacher, I would want one who's done it before. It's deep. It's uncompromising. It may stir things up, but when things are stirred up, it's just false cause and effect ideas. That something in the world can do something to our consciousness, when it was actually our consciousness that made the world, and ultimately our consciousness is the world. There's not a projected outside world and an inner consciousness, as if there's two. It's really the world you perceive is your consciousness. If you are having a frightening time, if you have a lot of fears that come up, doubts, insecurities, and you're quite frightened on planet Earth, we'll say, that's just because it's an infestation of consciousness. And the good news is, is it has already been healed. It's not that it will be healed, that the Spirit will someday heal. It, it has already been healed. But it is a question of how deep down the rabbit hole you want to go? Do you want to go toward that healing? Do you want to actually be shown? Do you want to have it all demystified? And just start to realize that that it's just consciousness and it's just thoughts that are the problem. Even the word consciousness, I mean a lot of us have heard the word consciousness for a long time. Some people even talk about Christ consciousness. What Jesus says is consciousness is the domain of the ego. That's an interesting line. Consciousness is the domain of the ego. So some teachers tell you, well, you've got a relationship classroom going on there, and you've got a work classroom going on, and you've got a, a classroom going on where you live in your environment. No, no, sorry. Those aren't classrooms. Those aren't classrooms. Those are projections. Those are distractions to coming to the classroom and your classroom is consciousness. You're going to go right smack on the domain of the ego and ask for the Holy Spirit's help, right in the middle of your consciousness. Right in the middle of the infestation is where the healing occurs. You can't solve a problem where it's not. But when you come back into consciousness, that's when we talk about raising consciousness. Remember in the 60s? Hey man, raise your consciousness. They were onto it. You know, come to a higher higher sense, but ultimately you're going to have to transcend consciousness altogether. If consciousness is the domain of the ego, you're not going to find reality in consciousness. People say, that's mind-blowing. Yeah, it sure is. That blew my mind. <laughs> so, it's, I would say, who knows, maybe we'll end up coming together again after everybody's read Unwind Your Mind, and it'll be like, wow. Let me tell you, this last year I have been <laughs> working on reversing cause and effect and, and coming to see that cause and effect are together and that time is, time is simultaneous instead of linear. And I've been coming into this m mystical experiences more and more consistently because of the healing that's occurring in me. And th that's the context for it. it it's, it's really not mystical. It's not mystifying at all. It's not mysterious. It's, it's really just application. Application. One time I came home and I think I came home to the Peace House and I think there was two people living there and they, they really believed that the milk had gone bad. I'm talking bad. Whatever they call it. Sour and whatever. And so they know that I like my cup, my glass of milk, so they, they just watched. And they didn't say anything, and they didn't even give me a hint or a clue. But I don't believe in bad milk. So I, I actually, I went there and I poured the glass and they watched me drink it down to the bottom with a little white whisker. <laughs> See, I wasn't in the damn, 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 I was in the ah, ah, mind over matter, mind over matter, everything that you experience is, is, a, is an interpretation of, of mind. Everything, 
without exception. And you just notice how your mind wants to go, but what about, <laughs> but what about, you know, it's going to try to make exceptions to that. That's why we had people like Mary Baker Eddy on the planet. Now that's uncompromising. I get tears in my eyes when I even think of her. That's uncompromising. There's no mind in matter. There's no life, truth, substance, or intelligence in matter. Well, if that's the fact, and that is the fact, then you can unplug. You know, that's what, uh, even at the beginning of the Matrix movie, you know, when he goes, you know, to, with the simulations, and he's going there, and they tell him, follow the white rabbit, you know, which is his next step to meet Trinity, and then to meet Morpheus, the guy says, hey man, looks like you need to unplug. You need to unplug. What are we unplugging from? False cause effect ideas in the mind. False beliefs. And what is the world but false evidence appearing real? You know, that's the acronym for fear. But where is the world coming from except consciousness and false beliefs? So, if you want to live in spiritual community, I'd say, wow, you, if you get into this, what I'm talking about, that's your spiritual community. Whether you're around other bodies or not, doesn't really matter. You're going through a transformation of consciousness. You're going through a healing in mind. You're unwinding your mind from the world. You're unwinding your mind back to God, back to pristine I amness. And, and then, as you go along, you're going to meet people, you're going to meet mighty companions, and you're going to have the most amazing people, and books, and music, and all kinds of spectacular things show up. And you can rejoice in those. You can go full into the joy with that. You can just say, thank you God. Wow, what a day. Thank you for everything that you're giving me. Thank you for this day. Thank you for all these witnesses. Thank you for opportunities to, to practice true cause-effect relationships. Thank you for the, all these opportunities to forgive or release these erroneous thoughts and beliefs. You can appreciate the hugs, appreciate the laughter, appreciate the music, appreciate the, the paintings of all the seeming shapes and sizes and colors, appreciate the expressions of affection, As, appreciate giving affection, receiving affection, relaxing, Wow, isn't it great to relax? Just, ah, just lay on the grass on a sunny day and go, thank you God, you know? And because it's, you go into full gratitude and appreciation, and, and in the meantime, all these, these opportunities arise from time to time to release, release this erroneous uh, thinking. It's a joyful life, I have to say, you know, when um, David was talking about the happy dream, you know, about us coming into a happy dream. It, the happy dream comes when our mind becomes clear, when we're, we're, we're into right-mindedness, or we're, we're, we turn the world you know, from upside down to right side up. And when you see it from that perspective, it's, it's glorious. It is a happy dream. And you don't have any kind of false expectations that you're looking for. You're not going around looking in time and space for what in form is going to fulfill you. That's, that's the human predicament of, you know, it's like that old show, Lost in Space. Remember Will Robinson? Danger, Will Robinson. Danger, you know. That's the ego in our mind. <laughs> danger, danger, danger. My gosh, there's no way to have fun. You can't, you can't be going around a planet and hearing, Danger, Will Robinson. You know, it's, it's just, you're all locked up. You're all chained up, as Lisa used to say, I'm all chained up. <laughs> That's how we would start one of our holy encounters. I'm all chained up. Okay, let's join. So, yeah, thank you, thank you for that. You're entitled to joy. May you have a joyful life. <laughs> yes. That exact same moment when you came out with the sour milk story, I was sitting there thinking, right before I came here, I felt like I wanted a nice cup of coffee, so I made a cup of coffee, Pour the milk in it, take a drink. It's sour. First cheap steam says, man, you just put two giant spoons of coffee in there. You can't throw that away, right? Exactly. And then I thought, well, Dave, he drank that sour milk, so I thought, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
fuck this and throw it in. <laughs> Be authentic. <laughs> That's good too. Fuck this. <laughs> That's good. I didn't tell you to do what I do. I just said, think like me. Think like me. Don't do what I do. Think like me. I just want everyone to think like me. Like, think with God is what I'm saying here. I'm just given these examples here. Not Some people walk on hot coals, you're like, hey, let's take the sour milk. <laughs> Part was the way I was sitting there thinking about the story, and here you come out talking about Sam <laughs> Wow, this is a trip, isn't it? <laughs> we sit in there, sometimes we sit in the main house, and we'll just sit around, they've got all these windows around us, and we'll sit there and talk for hours, and we'll mention someone, and they come walking right by as soon as we mention them, and then we go and talk about somebody, and then they walk right by. It's like, it's such a strong reflection of you know, my thoughts or images I have made, a workbook lesson from the Course. That it's not, there's not an inner and an outer. It just happens over and over again, and we laugh and laugh and laugh. And then you talk about somebody you haven't seen for months or whatever, you talk, and then there they go. It's like, they're, they're there too! It's like, <laughs> like you're in some kind of a spaceship, you know, a Star Trek episode <laughs> of Holodeck, and here they come. But that happens a lot. <laughs> All the time. Sundari's like all the time. <laughs> all the little pieces of music I was going to sing, he's almost talked about all of them. So. <laughs> okay. We're doing it virtually. We're doing it virtually. Yeah, it is like Solaris. Hi, David. Hi there. Um, yeah, it feels like during this time here, I've been feeling a lot of contraction, expansion, contraction. And it feels like there's a loosening of something during this process. And this leads me to, when you were talking about cause and effect, what came to me was, because this keeps, has been coming up a lot, but I also feel this, this week a loosening of this, um, that there seems to be a connection between cause and effect, this feeling of attack, defend, and the authority problem. And I feel like maybe there's something you might be able to offer me around this that might be helpful in letting some of this go even more fully. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, I think there was workbook lessons that started to work with me on that, like all things are lessons God would have me learn. and. I, I know I spent quite a lot of time and focus just following and following and following the teachings about God as the author of reality, and and it was this cause-effect thing too. The author is the cause, and Christ is the effect. And in this world, there's such suspicion um, that's just a right, it keeps like, it, it seems almost endless. It just keeps coming up, and, and the authority problem just rears up and rears up. Christian was talking briefly about that encounter with the cop down in Florida. Um, wow, have I had a lot of, of those kind of encounters. It's part of rinsing the mind, it's part of forgiveness. It can be with, with parents or elders or um, people that are, seem to be in positions of authority. And then when you get into spirituality and spiritual communities, it's just, it's the same thing. It's almost like it seems it just rolls on and on and on, like you're just dealing with this idea of, of authorship and, and authority. I, I liked when Helen um, was describing Jesus after she encountered Jesus speaking to her in her mind. Um, I liked the way that she described Jesus' voice. It wasn't an audible voice in her mind, but it was it was this cl very clear ch train, train of thought that, that she was hearing, very rapid actually. And she said that there was this authoritative voice that was sp speaking to her. She used the word authoritative, and I thought, how interesting. As I'm working with my authority problem, she's describing Jesus as authoritative. I talk to a lot of Catholics, and 
They're quite afraid of Jesus from their training. They like Mary. They're a little bit afraid of, not that much afraid of Mary, but really afraid of Jesus. And they like the angels. Most everyone I meet around the world I call the angels. I like them. They're my buddies. <laughs> Jesus, who? I don't know. Mary? Mm. But the angels. But it's this, because there's again, there's an, uh, the voice of Christ is authoritative. It's certain. And, and certainty is frightening to the ego. Because the ego is doubt, is fear, is hesitation. Of course it's going to be trembling. It, the ego knows there's something above it, but it doesn't know what that is. And it's really afraid of whatever that is <laughs> that's above it, so to speak. So, I think it plays out, like, I think it's beautiful that you have allowed, like, to work yourself, to work with the Course, and to work with Patrice, and to work with a little group, a Course group, in your home. I think that's like, that's been like a really good starting point. <laughs> I'm sure you've had a lot of <laughs> opportunities just in there. When Patrice yeah. looks in your eyes and speaks with all of the authority, certainty. the certainty. certainty, the authoritative voice of Christ coming through her, you know, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's your roommate, like, whoa, <laughs> what have I got in my house? What did I let in my house? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's there. And then with the, the group that comes in, and then recently you've done some travels, so that kind of opens up the, opens it a little wider when you're moving around. Wow, such opportunity to to look at the authority issue. You know, that's like it really pops up. It could be, yeah. you know, police officers or law officers. GPS, one person navigating, the other driving. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, the driver is trying to follow. Not knowing where we're going. Not yeah. So it comes up, and it comes up, and it comes up, and it certainly, of course it comes up in relationships, because it's, it's kind of this, it's this control thing. That's, I think that's really at the core of all authoritative, authoritative problem issues, is control. Like, the personality self is quite ambivalent about control. Sometimes it wants it. It wants to grab the leader role. Sometimes it wants to push off the leader role and it wants to follow. Mm -hmm. Guide me, show me, you know, that it's, I'm in the lead. No, nope. you, yeah. you, it's, your, it's all on you. you know, it just flips back and forth between yes. the leader and the follower. And, and, and Christ, the presence of Christ is more like, you know, don't walk ahead of me, I may not follow. Don't walk behind me, I may not lead. Walk beside me and hold my hand on the self-same road. That's, ah, that's the Holy Spirit. We, when we read that, we go, ah. The other part's, damn, 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 I'm a follower again. Damn, they want me to lead. I can't lead. You lead. No, I'm going to lead now. Or tomorrow. <laughs> you know, it just goes like that, back and forth, back and forth. And, and I think in the end, guidance is what is of the Spirit. That neutralizes the whole thing. It really, it takes you, you transcend this impossible situation and you start to see the impossibility of leading and following. But it has to come in through guidance. It has to come in through your, your willingness to, to engage in that guidance. There was a very famous Course in Miracles teacher who wrote me an email one time. I think he was drunk. <laughs> because he, he mistakenly sent it to me instead of his assistant. And, because his assistant was asking him a question, something about, David's traveling to this country, can we offer some of our contacts? And he said, no, don't give David any of our contacts in that country, because David is stealing students. <laughs> and I just had such a laugh when I, first of all, I don't think it was intended, he probably was drunk and, and sent it to me by mistake. Because <laughs> it wasn't addressed to me. It was about me, but it wasn't addressed to me. But it was, it was just a good reminder, again, to, it, you know, I think that's kind of funny, stealing students. At that point in my life, I, I had transcended the teacher concept, so I didn't see myself as a teacher or students, or ever having had students. You know, it's just, it's a state of mind. 
But that's where everything is equalized, you might say, in that state of mind. When you come into the presence, you know, that's what the whole purpose of all the mind training was. That's the purpose of hanging in there, of, of going with this, sticking with it, sticking with it. And you, you start to really get, have that experience. Yeah, I mean, when you said, uh, you talked about uh, trusting guidance, I think, yeah, I'm still moving into that, I'm kind of leaning into that, you know, trusting that it's there for me, as well as Patrice. <laughs> yeah, I trust her guidance more than I trust the guidance that I get. Yeah, it's beautiful that you're aware of that, because that's, even with living in spiritual community, that's where the transfer, you know, has to come. You, you have to start to see that, that it's always been coming from in your, in your awareness, in your consciousness, and it's coming through in that way, and it's not really from persons. Mm -hmm. But we have role models, we have bright witnesses, we have people that we seem to trust for a while, and then the Spirit's saying, okay, now it's beyond the flesh. You know, trust in me, trust in me, stay with me, abide with me. I mean, the higher self, you know, that inner voice. And that, that is part of an undoing. One time I was in the monastery over there, and I was at my desk, and I think Helena came in, and uh, Lisa came in. And then they started crying. And I said, what's, what's going on here? And they said, you are going to die one day. And they started crying. They, they were mourning the death of David. I said, well, it's good to start early, maybe. You know, it's, it's start now. I have no plans of, <laughs> of checking out or anything, but, but they were. And so, you know, it's just a thought, any kind of thought, a thought of death of a loved one, a thought of loss of a loved one, a pet, a friend, um, even with these seeming proper monastery has been great. We've just we've we've got the monastery up for sale. It's I like that. You know, I I feel like it's all just a, an inner experience. So it it's good if you put things for sale or you do things like this where people notice their attachments or no please. If the monastery goes, then strawberry would like no strawberry is not uh, the monastery. You know, it's this. We call it strawberry state of mind. Strawberry state of mind is invulnerable. Strawberry feels forever. It's it's that. But but we have things that happen, seemingly, and and it's only the interpretation of loss. It's only the interpretation that that holds us back. And so, you know, in one sense, you could say, like Patrice has been like a mentor, like a teacher. You have great love for that. And most of the time, that's exactly what you're feeling, is just gratitude. And then every once in a while, it's like, by golly, I can't believe she said that. <laughs> you know, or whatever. Yeah. And that's where the authority problem just yeah. appears. Wanting to bolt. Yeah. Yeah. Wanting to bolt. Oh, no. <laughs> I yeah. can't take it anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, you know, underneath all that, I, I definitely know, I know I'm exactly where I need. And I know, just from knowing you both, and knowing who, what what a gift you are for her, and what a gift yeah. she I see the gift just shining and glowing, and how through your collaborations, and you're diving into this thing together, it's just, you both have been lifted and lifted, and, and you couldn't have done it no. alone. No, no. I feel such love and appreciation, just, I feel honored actually, you know, that I was able to behold the witness. Whenever two come together in a holy relationship, whatever one seems to need, the other provides. You know, that brings tear to my eyes when I think of that, because it's so simple when we join in holiness. It's, mm -hmm. I get many, many witnesses of that, where people tell me, I couldn't have done it without him or her. Mm -hmm. You know, she gave me so much, and yet it's just a reflection of how big your heart is, how, yeah. how gracious you've been, how 
willing you've been. You've just drawn forth these witnesses and most of the time that's what it is. It's really relatively rare when the authority problem rears up, but it's so intense that you want to, like in the James Bond car, you want to find the eject button as <laughs> 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 yeah. it's going over yeah. the cliff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm out of here. And it feels like it takes up so much space. But that's just perception, too. That's not necessarily real. Just sing that song. But it was just my imagination <laughs> running away with me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, David. Elisa. The thing about reversing cause and effect is definitely fascinating for me, and I just wanted to share a dream that I had um, to see if it speaks to that for you. Um, I dreamed that I was a group of people. <laughs> that couldn't figure out how to die. <laughs> so they decided that they were going to divide into small, smaller and smaller people. They kept dividing and kept dividing, thinking that maybe they could die if they got smaller and smaller and smaller, until it was just an infinite amount of particles or something, and they still couldn't die. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> they still couldn't die. Oh, wow. <laughs> cool. What a dream. <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> Sylvia, over there. Help you have something. I'm wondering how you distinguish between the voice of guidance or whatever form that takes from the voice of ego. And I'm guessing that it takes different forms for different people, but maybe you could speak to how it shows up for you, and, and, and any thoughts about how it shows up differently for different people? Yeah, I, I call that a, a question of discernment. I feel like that the whole seeming journey is a journey of discernment, of really coming to that clarity of, of the voice for God and, and the voice of the ego. And I would say, yeah, everything that I seem to do and everything that I seem to experience I've tried to be as transparent and write about it, express it on the internet. I've tried to be like a, a transparent mystic, where anything that I've found helpful in that discernment, which is a lifelong devotion, actually, not like a simple thing. The simplest way is how do you feel? But the ego generates all kinds of feel-good, even emotions that aren't, aren't really the spirit either. It's just part of a trick. So it takes a lot of discernment. And then, it, that cause and effect stuff that I was talking about it really helped me, because sometimes people say the ego can disguise itself to sound like the Holy Spirit, but, but the, the Holy Spirit never commands and never demands, so I kind of get the feel for the voice. Is there some kind of commanding or demanding going on here at all? And I said, that's, that's not it. Also, um, the ego is big on external causes. Um, it, it's always teaching and that there are external causes, and that gives it away. You know, it can be as clever and sound as good as it wants, and as soft and mellow as it wants, but when there's the belief in external causation, or it will try to say that, that somehow you can have a, a little mix of heaven and hell. It would like to, you know, have a mixture of heaven and hell, and so thoughts that, that support mixing real thoughts and illusory thoughts, you know, it's very sl clever that way. You know, it, it, you have, it takes a while to look at that. Like, there's a lot of, of signs and symbols all, along the way. Uh, some of you are aware of, like, conversations with God, Neil Donald Walsh, and there's a, it's a lot of helpful things in his books and writings, because it starts to open it up from the church and organized religion to this intimate sense of talking to God. Or as uh, John Denver said, talk to God and listen to the casual reply. And that's, that's helpful. And yet, when you go deeper into those teachings, there's still this idea that God had something to do with the world. And it's, it's actually still, if you go deeper into those, it's still dualistic teaching. So, Another thing that 
um, basically is of the spirit is it's purely non-dual. It's always coming from a non-dual perspective, from a perspective that transcends heaven and hell and these opposites. And so yeah, that was good help for me when I would listen to lots of non-dual teachers and I would kind of listen and discern and let the spirits do the discerning. It, it, it gets finer and finer and finer to that point of make no exceptions. You know, it's, the teachings of the Holy Spirit are always non-dual. So those are, there's feeling components to it, there's um, components where there's, where you see that the Spirit doesn't try to mix, mix the two worlds or mix some version of duality and singularity, and, and then there's that pure non-dual essence that, that comes through, you know, teachings like the Course and, and a lot of other, Advaita Vedanta and a lot of other wonderful non-dual teachings. So, it's, it's, I find many things are helpful, many, many things. Even movies, you know, like we watched that movie, uh, The Kid, and that was a beautiful teaching. That that helped clarify uh, the the voice that that voice within versus the the voice of the world, the image consultant, and you could just see almost juxtapose what was helpful and what was not. You know, even discerning through movies. Yeah, comes in many ways. Thank you, Sylvia. The Course teaches us that perception is an outward picture of an inner condition, right? So I don't remember where I read this, but it, the example was um, a woman who understood that but what she saw, she was an animal lover, and what she saw was someone beating a dog to death. And it traumatized her because she felt responsible, because she perceived it, then she was the cause in her mind. And can you speak about that? Yeah, when, when people read that line in the Course, Perception is an outward picture of an inward condition. Those are still metaphors because the mind that's sleeping believes in inner and outer. Mm -hmm. And when you actually give yourself over to those workbook lessons though, uh, the Master, Jesus, is, is, is zooming the mind in to start to see that, that there really isn't an inner and an outer. That that's one of those metaphors in the, in the text. But if you look at his strategy, you know, he starts off with nothing I see means anything. So he's starting off with perception. I have given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me. He's still talking about perception, you know, and, and that all meaning was given. As if there's an inner, inner thought or inner ego that's giving this external world all the meaning that it has. I have given all, he's talking egoically there at the beginning. Because he's got to work with reversing cause and effect right there in the workbook. Then he finally gets to lesson four and he starts talking about thoughts. And and he comes back talking about thoughts in number ten. But as he progresses through the workbook, like my meaningless thoughts are showing me a meaningless world, he's making a connection between the thoughts that you think you think and the world that you think you see. Because he knows at the beginning it seems like the human being is perceiving through five senses. It believes it has a little private mind with private thoughts whirling around there, sometimes even associated with the brain and brain activity, which isn't the truth, but it's it's where the mind believes it is. And then, you know, as it goes through, it's starting to make the beginning connections between the thoughts that you think you think, which aren't your real thoughts, and the world and the images that you think you perceive, which aren't your real perceptions. <laughs> It isn't your happy dream either, because as long as there's an inner and an outer, then there's guilt, because it's just not the truth. So a lot of time, Course in Miracles students, they'll be very sincere, and they'll be working with the, the text and doing the workbook and everything, but they, if there's something like a cancer or a, 
a dog that's beaten up or uh, their house, you know, catches fire and they go, oh, well, I, you know, I burned my house down today and, you know, you, it's going to be guilt inducing. <laughs> you know, I killed off my mother, I burned the house down, you know, now I, this body has cancer, you know. It's, it's this association um, of the error still seemingly that thoughts and the manifested world are different. That there's an actual external world. The, the healing is start to realize is that there isn't. Because in the end, that's what lets go of this belief in mistreatment. That we were talking about attack thoughts, you know, uh, I think it's lesson 23, I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. Now, the way to do that is you have to actually come to just see attack thoughts as attack thoughts, but in the world, what seems to be an external world, it's acted out in various ways. Some seem to be the victims, some seem to be the victimizers, and in the world of form, those are very different positions. No one in the world of form would say victims are the victimizers. They'd say the victims are victimized, and, and the victimizers are the perpetrators, and we have names for them. Terrorists, you know, and so on and so forth. So, once you realize that, that attacking and being attacked are both the same because they're just attack thoughts, then you're willing to let them go. But as long as you still keep playing these roles and believing you're out on the screen, then it's always, oh, they hurt me, they, they wronged me, they stole my money, they lied to me, they cheated, all these things. You, you, you get caught in believing that victimization and attack are real. Once you start to realize that it's all, so to speak, in your consciousness, then you're willing to let them go. You start to see that attack does not serve anymore. It doesn't serve your peace of mind, for sure. <laughs> and, and, but the end is, is that the inner and outer are the same. So it, you see how this goes way beyond this idea of persons creating cancer, or a personal mind creating cancer, or a bloodied, a beaten dog, or whatever. Because there's always still guilt, you know, into this, like, wow, that's, uh, I'm doing it to myself and shame on me. You know, it's very, very dark. Uh, a line that I like to emphasize is, you are not responsible for the error, you are responsible for accepting the correction for the error. To me, that puts the emphasis right on the correction, right on forgiveness. And it takes it off of like fault finding, including fault finding in your mind, you know, looking and, and identifying your identity with those thoughts. Oh, I created that cancer. No, 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 no. That's not, that's not true. I, I created that scenario. I created that situation. That's, that's new, new age mumbo jumbo. <laughs> it's not, it's guilt inducing, you know, it's, it's still kind of sees cause and effect as, as a part, and now it's kind of coming up with a metaphysical story that still is not accurate. We have to actually join with the Holy Spirit and see that this world is unreal effects from an unreal cause. The ego made the body, the ego made the world. It's an unreal cause that has generated unreal effects. And ideas leave not their source, so that also means that that these atrocities, so-called judgments, are really out there. You know, you have to find the villain within, so to speak, which is the ego, and the Holy Spirit overlooks the defiled altar, overlooks the villain, and, and sees the innocence. But that all comes from unified mind. So what you're describing is kind of getting caught in the metaphors, like caught on a rung, and using the rung to beat yourself up. You know, it's just not... Thank you.